So here on the Broadcasters Podcast, there have been several issues I've talked about when it comes to Hollywood. There is the issue of the disruption, which we know now through Hollywood, the digital disruption, streaming media, it's, we've seen it through music, we've seen it through the movies, we've seen it all around, it is a major worldwide changing effect. The other one we have as well, besides the pandemic, which when we were recording this program, obviously we were dealing with that, so everybody can chronicle that, put that in your journal if you still do that. The other thing we've had is the issue of DEI, and I've brought that up here on the show many times, diversity, equality, and inclusion. Now, we're not necessarily going to go into this route on my guest coming up now, but it is important to this aspect because of the area of the Me Too movement. And I'm here with somebody that has really heralded and really been a voice for this movement and has done a lot of work. But obviously, with the, the background that she has in Hollywood gives her a great platform. And also, she has a really good platform right now that she's using through the world of podcasting. She's done it through documentaries. So let me go ahead and tell you who our guest is. She is international model, actress, and producer Rachel Mullins. She's an international model turned actress who started her career at the age of 12. Produced viral campaigns for mega brands in addition to short films and web series. She's been living and working in Hollywood for over a decade. Produced and directed a feature leak documentary called You Slut. And now you host the podcast No Filter Friday on Public House Media. Rachel, thanks for being on the Broadcasters Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad we got you to do this. I'm so glad that we had the opportunity as well. I really, like I said before we got on, really love what you've been doing. Amazing work. Now, there's so much I could talk about when it comes to your career and really do the almost the press junket, if you will, the extended one. But I'm going to just do this because of where we're going to go in this conversation. I want to just go and point out, you know, this is a nice little nod. You did an episode of Mavens Do It Better with uh, Heather Johnson. I did with Heather Newman. Yeah, that was really recent, actually. Episode 62 was a great conversation. I thought you went through a lot of different details, especially what you've done in your career, acting, filmmaking, uh, modeling, all of that. I thought that was a great, good contextual. It gives you a good idea of everything that is Rachel Mullins. But I want to go ahead and talk into what you've been doing in your work. So, first of all, to give the context of what you've done in Hollywood, you've done a lot of TV work. You were the character Sam on ABC's Happy Endings. You were on yep. Fox's, Fox TV's The Finder, ABC's Don't Trust to Be in Apartment 23. I still laugh at that. Episode. That. <laughs> <laughs> you were on CSI on CBS, New York, and a number of streaming series. You make it also, and I heard it on the uh, Move, Maybe Let's Do a Better podcast, have you been on a number of movie TV sets? You were on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I love the movie, God bless. Yeah. And you, on, and you were on uh, Showtime's Black Monday. So great stuff. Talk to me about yeah. the direction that your acting career has taken thanks to you know, when you've had Netflix and Amazon, Amazon and Hulu versus the rest of what you've been doing in traditional establishment cable and network TV. Well, I mean, okay, so here's a, here's a fun story. Uh -huh. So because I've been working for 19 years now, I get to say things like, we used to shoot on film and there was no retouching. <laughs> and <laughs> Right. Um, that is that has changed over the years, but I actually worked on one of the seven original Amazon pilots, and, wow. and which is kind of a cool thing. I was also working on the first movie that was ever made for YouTube, um, like a legit movie that was actually made for YouTube. Yeah, um, that was directed by Sebastian Gutierrez. So I got to do some firsts on this like digital front thing, which was really cool. Um, but when I got the call for that Amazon pilot, I was working on the um, Harlem Shake video for Glee. Yeah. And they're like, hey, can you, do you want to come play uh, Ed Bagley Jr.'s like crazy girlfriend that like ties him up? Her name's Debbie. And I'm like, <laughs> she, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? And I'm like, okay, I'm like, okay, great. They're like, okay, so it's digital. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. I can see that. I mean, it's... I was like, yeah, that was like a new thing. But now did you also notice the same thing where, okay, in podcasting 10 years ago, I, I say this story a few times. The Don and Mike show was a nationally syndicated show that was on radio at the time, right after the death of Anna Nicole Smith. And I called into their show, mentioning, and they kind of gave me, called me out, asking what do I do for a living, you know, trying to tell them what to do, how to, how to talk about their, uh, their radio show. And I said, I do podcasting. And at the time they said, oh, so you basically work at a McDonald's. <laughs> Like, that's the kind oh of respect God. I had. So I'm imagining <laughs> that's the kind of respect that you almost felt like, and it wasn't, it wasn't like, maybe it just felt like almost like a devaluing of your craft, but well, you really didn't know. That. It's just like, it's just, it, you think about like, oh God, what is the set going to be like? Like, that's what you're, that's what you're fearing. Like, right. is there going to be water? 
<laughs> like, what's going on here? Like, these, that's the things that I worry about anyway, because I'm very happy to be paid in snack. Like, that's fine, but like, I'm going to need this to be kosher. So, yes. I was like, okay, let's do this. Like, we'll see what it's like. And like, I love Ed. Like, I knew him prior. So, like, like okay, cool. Let's do this. And I got there, and this set was so beautiful. <laughs> it was so gorgeous. They spent $3 million on that pilot, which is like, I mean, HBO occasionally spends that much on a pilot, but right. like that was, you know, that was a very healthy pilot budget. And they were, everybody was like really, really nice. And this is how I got to meet Jeff Bezos was oh that um, we were all just like sitting in our chairs, like sitting around forever. I think I was like either the, like the martini or the Abby Singer shot of the day, which doesn't surprise me because that happens to me all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just sitting around in my chair basically all day. And then they paraded like the entire, all of the Amazon executives like came through and was like, Oh, hi, thanks for being here. We're like, yeah, sure. Totally. <laughs> um, and that's, I was like, Oh, okay. So this is going to be cool. But yeah, they just, but that's what studios do. Like if you ask anybody that works in the studio system, like they just get the, the best people they can find and then just shower them with cash and hope for the best. <laughs> like that's, right. Now, one thing I, I got noticed too is that, And for myself, I know there's been a number of shows I watched that were ABC Network shows. And I know I passed by Happy Endings and I uh, uh, every so often. And don't trust to be in Apartment 23. ABC Studios always has a kind of like a cookie cutter approach. And they do like to cast certain characters into multiple shows. So in one show, if it doesn't necessarily pan out, they do that. And just, okay, let's fit this person back into place. Like, you know, um, it's what it is. But I guess for me, the difference between talk to me about the difference between what you're seeing now in the digital, uh, the streaming media studios compared to what you had in network, because you can see the difference in budget, the difference in sets, the difference in creativity. Um, cre- I mean, traditional television takes forever in a day to make, like you'll spend years yeah. in development. Like I, that's why I don't even really mess with TV from like a producer standpoint, because like, I do not have the time. No. Um, and then like, you know, the shows that just got bought, like, just now through pilot season, yeah. um, those took years to develop, and they're going to be a complete wash, because by the time this is all, you know, it's not going to write itself to a world that we were living in before, but, like, the world going forward, when we're not all locked in our houses, like, those are all going to be off the slate. They're going to have to completely... Oh, I mean, and I'm going to ask you about that a little bit, because... It's not just the fact that you're going to have this pandemic that's going to hold everything back. Then you also have other things with the labor disputes. And I want to ask you very briefly about that in a little bit. My thing is just that when I look at all of this, I'm just saying to myself, you know, I feel like anybody that's doing anything through Netflix or Amazon or Hulu, they're kind of just, they're showing up everybody on terrestrial. Like, okay, you get old guard. You do this antiquated protocol way. Like it's still Mm -hmm. 1970. You're like about to launch all in the family. No, it's not that way anymore. And I think, you know, it took them a long time to get used to limited series, doing eight, 10, 13 episodes. I'm still surprised there's still 22 and 24 episode runs. CBS can do it because of the audience. It's just an older audience, and that's what works. And, I mean, even with the CBS sets, I mean, every show is formulaic. Even Hawaii Five-0, Magna P.I., you can look at yeah, all the... Yeah, I mean, those are all, those are all procedural. Those are all procedural shows. And they almost look the same. Yeah, and then that's how you, you know, that's how you keep a show on the air. Like, stuff like Law & Order that's been on forever in a day, or... Um, Jerry Bruckheimer stuff the you know, all the CSIs like, and that's, that's great. Like as an actor, like that's like the dream to get a, a serious regular on a procedural show. You're going to work until the end of time. Like that's the, that's the dream. Absolutely. That is the absolute dream. Now I do want to ask this too about the fact that I always feel like there's something to be said about, yeah, there is, I mean, I think, digital streaming is still more of the passion projects. And I think when you have big stars that are just willing, be willing to get a lot of cash to go and come in and do a project of their own volition without anybody telling what to do, I still think the best content for me is still pay cable. I still think your HBOs, your Showtimes, your stars are putting out tremendous content. you got a chance to get in that environment. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, premium cable is bomb because they don't necessarily have to abide by like primetime network TV rules. And that's where you can have things like Game of Thrones or Sex in the City. You know, you can, those kinds of places are the, are the kind of environment where you can push a genre forward. Um, There's a really good 
interview, which is what we should all strive to do in people that are filmmakers or whatever it is that you do. Like, are you like, that's always a question that you should be trying to answer when you're putting something together is how are we pushing the genre forward? Is this, you know, are we contributing to the genre or are we just, you know, out here flopping around? Um, there's a really great interview with Kim Cottrell when she talked about like going over like the dialogue um, for the character of Samantha and that never in the history of television had a woman spoke like that on TV. And she's like, how do I even say this? And she, you know, <laughs> she, and she obviously figured it out. Um, but that pushing that, that those premium cable environments are a place where you can push a genre forward and, you know, lead into the next, and I don't feel like it's getting any, I don't feel like the level of content is getting any less, which is the best part. I mean, oh, no. no, that's it, wonderful. And I'm that's the great thing about the technology that we're shooting on today between Ari's and Reds. And like, I just got a new Sigma FP that I'm absolutely in love with. It's the smallest full frame mirrorless camera and it does digital. Uh, it, it does stills and I can shoot cinema DNG file on it and raw. Like it's so beautiful, wow. but <laughs> it's so <laughs> amazing and gorgeous. Um, or like the Santa, the Canon C100, the Canon C200, um, they shot a lot of uh, mm -hmm. the stuff for Ant-Man on those small cameras because they're trying to track these little teeny tiny things and, yeah. you know, like an Aria Alexa or a Red Dragon, like within a full cinema rig just can't get in there. Um, right. So we have the, we have, it is this upswing in technology in the, just the production side. Um, or I could go on and on and on all day about like tentacle boxes and like, the advancement that that's made for sound <laughs> and you can do this really small thing and make it look amazing. Now we'll say one thing and that comes for every project, no matter what I, and I've talked to sound uh, engineers about this as well. I talked to the sound engineers that did a uh, blade runner 2042 and I just said, mm -hmm. listen, please sound God bless some of these people that they just don't get the sound right on a lot of these shows. And it's really, really easy to biff it. It's something and like the sound department just gets kind of, pushed into corner and you know they're just there under their headphones and like people kind of forget about them but like as, as a director like that's like my main people that i'm like your main people that you're talking to is your supervisor your dp and your sound guy like you are a you're you should be moving as a unit like Absolutely. Unless, I mean, yeah, you're making program you're ahead. making content for for studio uh, for surround sound but here okay only so much Foley, more dialogue, please. <laughs> Just yeah. get it, get the mics on them. Come on, get the boom mic on there. So uh, with that said, and on, honestly, for me, Showtime and HBO have been across the board, but Showtime, honestly, everything from Homeland to Billions to Ray Donovan to Shameless. I mean, just... I worked on Ray Donovan. Range. John Boyd adopted me. It was great. <laughs> oh, my God. That must have been a great show. And I mean, and I'm glad they're getting their final season. I was a little bit upset that they we're not going to do that. I just yeah. feel like that show kind of jumped the shark when they moved over. It's like Nip Tuck. I feel like it's exactly the same scenario. But it, I, well, I believe it's a lot of the same people. And it's a very close aesthetic. Yeah, no, and honestly, uh, what is it? Ann Biederman, who did uh, executive produces the series, I love Southland. So, like, when I followed along, I was like, oh, yeah. And then Lee Schreiber won me over. And John Voight, great character. My God, I love that show. I love John so much. I've been working on John for years because I would see him at like events and stuff. Uh -huh. And he was always so nice to me. The first day that I met him, I had to give this like very short talk about just my own personal opinions on things. And he came over to me. He's like, this is before Ray Donovan, which is how we got real. <laughs> um, but he came over to me and he's like, you know what? I'm thinking about doing this college speaking tour. You should come with me. And I melted. I melted. And I was like, oh, my God. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I've been, we've been texting for like years, <laughs> like yeah. working on this. And then when I worked on Ray Donovan, he's like, "Oh my God, you're here! Hey, what's up?" <laughs> and it was the and it was the week the same week that Brad and Angelina were getting divorced. So he was out. There was a position available. Wow. And you know, thanks for having John. Fantastic. No, yeah, no, John, uh, Mickey, Mickey Donovan. That's a that's a hell of a character to play. Uh, and also, I always think about like him playing good bad guys because I used to still remember him being that center and enemy, enemy of the state with uh, Will Smith and Gene Hackman. I still think what a prick role he had in there, but it was really well done. Now I got to get on. Uh, let me move along here because I can talk about your career for so much. But let's move on to the podcast. You run a podcast yeah. called No Filter Friday. It's on Public House Media podcast network that aims to improve the quality of conversation on the internet and give a voice to those with something to say describing uh the show 
Hollywood, quote, is rife with scandal after scandal. What is held as common knowledge around Tinseltown shocks the public. When the story breaks, the mainstream media only publishes what they think is digestible. So what are the main narratives you hope to bring, that you do bring to light with each episode, the underlying narratives that happen every episode that you do? Um, most of, most of all, the media does two things. Either they leave out, whether conveniently or inconveniently, they leave out like major, major pieces of information, or sometimes they just flat out lie about stuff. Yep. Um, which I think is the Me Too movement has a really interesting relationship with the media because like this would have happened a long time ago had the media ran the story. So like now, because it's making the media money and everybody's, you know, it's really, really great clickbait. They're all into it, but yep. there's yep. if you drive down Robertson Boulevard, like there's signs that were like the editor of, um, I think it's Hollywood Reporter, like she knew what Harvey was doing and she killed the story on several occasions. Oh. And lots of, you know, lots of these media outlets killed the story on Harvey and a lot of other people, Kevin Spacey, Charlie Sheen, yep. Um, yep. you know, lots and lots of these people got, you know, either covered for or the story buried or they just printed flat out lies um i'm so like, surprised matt lauer has not been indicted yet honestly you know he's he's kicking around he, i mean he's got or like um i know another guy on twitter that was um assaulted by like a male news broadcaster um and he's still like this guy's still working like he's having the hardest time ever like you know, you know, being a silence breaker on this guy because it's two guys. Yeah. And nobody, you know, like that's just not, um, it's just not a sexy narrative that the media really wants to play with. No. Um, and I mean, I, I appreciate you doing the podcast because I know you've brought on some movie of some filmmakers and others been doing their own documentaries of their own. I saw that. And just uh, some of the commentary, you know, I'm hundred percent with you on the me uh, on the media itself. And this is the problem is because, you know, there is, and I've thought, and I've railed on this on this program a lot because of the fact the news media in general, they do not ask the five questions: who, what, when, where, and why. They let no, they opinion editorial cloud into. It's now is completely mixed, and for whatever reason, it's. And I, the National Choir has more integrity than me than any news outlet these days. All your digital media no, you're outlets. You're not the first person in my life that said that. It's a, it's, I'm embarrassed. I studied to be a journalist. I'm embarrassed in this industry right now. And there are still good reporters out there. I must preface that. But it does bother me that I don't see proper reporting. Even right now with this pandemic, there's so much misinformation. And everything that comes down to whatever particular stories, it is on a political narrative. Or it's just a narrative where, okay, let's just take somebody down that's very powerful. But, you know, there's justification for Several cases. I mean, you only see times where, okay, somebody gets tumbled down. A Bill Cosby, a Harvey Weinstein, justifiably so. After so much rampant yeah, abuse. Hundreds of people. <laughs> right. At, well, what, at what point do you justify enough? And how many people have to know the hidden secret before it finally comes out? We need this to break. And this is why I think, you know, internally, in terms of government, and I think just all across, there's an establishment type of thinking. And I, we have, to, it's got to get shattered. I think grassroots thinking, and really that's what, that's what affects Hollywood. That's what affects Washington, D.C. in general. I, I, I think it's all, and New Absolutely. York City. I mean, look at the, look at, I mean, feel however you want about like the current coronavirus, but like, it should be shocking and appalling to everyone how much the media has controlled the minds of the entire world. It's incredible. They don't talk when, about anything in like, Europe. They don't even talk about China, really, where it all began and started. Nothing no, is said. And honestly, nothing I, at all. The all your honestly, the only thing the media is good for at all, and which you know they're doing what they want to do. It's their narrative. You know, I'm just you can turn it off. And that's fine. Okay, that's how we could justify that. And I have. I, I just, I will will not watch. The only thing I want to watch is I'll watch C-SPAN. I'll watch briefings. I'll watch, you know, local briefings. But I can find it online. I don't I don't need the anybody else to be the opinionators or the pundits that will tell me what yeah, I'm like, looking at a briefing. I can look at it myself and know what's me, going on. Yeah. yeah. Just let me see the broadcast and I will make my own opinions. Thank you. Like, there's... No I got need. a bars to kill. I can watch it on my yeah. phone. I don't need to go in and watch you anymore. You're irrelevant. And that goes for even the entertainment media where, you know, the thing is, too, it's a corporatization. When you know, what is it, Hollywood Reporter, Billboard, 
well, Variety and Deadline are basically owned by the same company anyway. Like this, these corporate conglomerates, they decide, okay, we just need to get all these outlets to monetize. We don't give a shit about what the content really is. Maybe there's some integrity within the newsroom. Maybe there's some people that really do good stuff, and thank you for doing that. But ultimately, you know, the real top CEOs, the, the real pedal, you know, the pencil pushers, they're the ones that are pushing this around, and it's not doing anything for the good of the public and also for Hollywood. I mean, you know, they don't want to talk about the labor union problems, all these things that are going on. But I'm going to get back to Me Too real quick. So I want to ask you about this because we have seen the ramifications of the Me Too movement. It's it created a lot. Harvey Weinstein is at the pinnacle of it, the tip of the spear. October 2018, New York Times wrote, hashtag Me Too brought down 201 powerful women. women uh, sorry, 201 powerful men. Nearly half of the replacements are women. Now, in this story, they say this. Let me take this uh, out of this passage real quick. Quote, a year later, even as the Me Too movement meets a crackling backlash, it's possible to take some stock of how the Harvey Weinstein case has changed the corridors of power. The analysis of the New York Times found that since their expose, followed by a New Yorker investigation, the Ronan Farrow story, these 200 prominent men have lost their jobs. Uh, few, including Mr. Weinstein, faced criminal charges. 920 people came forward to say that one of these men subjected them to sexual misconduct. 920 people. That's ridiculous. So now we're seeing this replacement by women. Now, what do you think, Rachel, about this correction? And do you think this, I mean, I can justify where I talked about diversity, equality, inclusion, where this is the case where it happens here. This is where you shake the system and you bring people that perform. But I don't think it necessarily needs to be where it's just like, okay, we want to just completely change the course that, you know, no man should be holding these positions. It should be just the right people. But this, for the good of any industry, we need diversity, equality, inclusion. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I think that I think that kind of number of like these women replace them is like kind of overreaching. Like, who are they? Because like, like there's no version, there's no female version of Harvey Weinstein. Like, he's his own enigma. And I'll like for other industries, like maybe not, but like for entertainment, especially like your aesthetic or what you do or like your personal brand of things like is unique to you. Like that's why we'll never have a, a different Michael Bay or a different Steven Spielberg or yeah. um, yeah. any of these people, because that's unique to them. Like you can't just be like, okay, um, all that, like if you took a, a movie and Steven Spielberg was the head and, you know, Kathleen Kennedy's producing and like all the way down the line, like all those people that they use all the time. Yep. If you just took Spielberg out and replaced him with, Eva DuVernay or, you know, we'll go even closer. Captain Bigelow. <laughs> like, we'll go even closer, right. as close as we can. Yeah. It's still going to be a different thing. So it's, it's not, in that sense, it's not like replacing them because that's not, that's not really possible. Um, you're shifting it to a different situation. And I think a lot of it is like a, like a safety thing too. Like I've gotten quite a few clients I shouldn't say clients, I should say collaborators, um, that have come to me like, hey, I want to do this thing, I want to do this, I want to do this music video, blah, 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 that are women, and it's a lot easier for them to come to me because I can give them what they want, and I can do the thing for them, and I'm not like, oh, hey, also show me your tits. Like, <laughs> you know, like, we're, as a matter of fact, they usually end up having to see mine at some point. Like, that's, <laughs> like, that's. It, it they, comes down they, to, they, yeah, there's they a lot of Hollywood show, not me. The yeah. old Hollywood is still not <laughs> gone. There's still a stain left from it, you know? Um, really? I, I, well, I just think, well, I always think about Robert Evans, right? The kid stays in the picture. And I think Robert about Evans, who just recently passed away. I know. Well, I, I mean, brought a lot of great movies to, to light. I will we'll admit, you know, and, uh, <sighs> wow. Yeah, that well, got the glass coffee table still a thing, but, you know. Yeah. It was there before him. It'll be long after he's gone. No, but I mean, it's just, it also is just indicative of the style of the casting couch, that whole thought on concept. But I want to bring this up. This quote about Harvey Weinstein after he was convicted. <clears throat> this was great. Sharon Waxman and the rap. She writes this. The convicted mogul, this is like an obituary for Harvey Weinstein. The convicted mogul whose reign of power over the entertainment industry lasted for three decades, who was once synonymous with quality filmmaking and winning Academy Awards, now becomes an everlasting symbol of the worst behavior toward women chronicled in the annals of modern entertainment. 
I would not want to be that. And not even not even not even my worst enemy would want to have that kind of tag. But let me ask no, you. I think, I think they left out the men to base anybody who's ever worked for Harvey or Bob Weinstein will tell you that they're absolute pieces of garbage. <sighs> like, you know, casting yeah. touch or not. Like any working with them in any capacity was always terrible for everyone, which is why I always compare it to like the Brutus and Caesar situation. Mm-hmm. As soon as that one first person finally got that knife from Harvey, everybody was like, we should all just totally stab Caesar. Like they went full Gretchen Wieners and, you know, just yeah. everybody for him. He was such an, he made himself such an easy takedown because he's never been nice or kind to anyone a day in his life. He's always screaming at people, anybody from Miramax, Dimension. Yeah. The Weinstein Company, anybody who's ever worked there from the mail room to the, you know, C-suite, doesn't matter. They will all tell you that he was horrible, as was Bob. But Bob just kind of got slid out of the situation. Yeah. Um, and that's I, that's why I always call Harvey the sacrificial lamb, because most of the time what he was with doing was with adults, save for Kate Beckinsale and a few other people. Yeah. Um, but like he's the sacrificial lamb of the entire Me Too movement because what's about to come out is way, way, way disgusting. Or like, had we not had this Harvey situation with a conviction and this, that, and the other thing, and Bill Cosby to an extent as well, Corey Feldman couldn't have talked about Charlie Sheen raping no. Corey Bain. Not publicly. No. Him and I have talked about it in his fucking house in his you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> like not not publicly, you know, not so. This is uh, it's, so. It's funny. Him and I were texting the other day about like divine timing and like how this is all playing out and how beautiful mm-hmm. it is. But um, it's you know all of these things in like the media. That is one thing. That I'm not going to say that they got right, but like I understand the method to the madness of like, okay, let's do the easy one first, the digestible one first, and then we'll get down into the gross, disgusting underbelly that is the rampant pedophilia. <laughs> In this town. Oh my God! I I can oh, exactly right. It's unfortunate that, that they just again. Okay, we have to give somebody up. Here we go, and just and I didn't nobody like him anyway. Take him. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And but the thing is, I mean, it's never going to get completely cured. I would imagine. I would hope it will, but I think a good purge is what really needs to happen in certain environments because this is becoming. I mean, this just you know. And for the most important thing, it's a power grab. Harvey Weinstein, I, I mean, whatever a piece of shit you are, you couldn't have gone like every other person, like any other like celebrity. Okay, if you want to go find somebody that's just some starlet that is starving to go ahead and do something with you and feels like, okay, if they're willing to go ahead and consent, and consent is the word, but that yeah. never even came across. And it wasn't even, it was so far past that of anything. I mean, the wife. No, any he, of his he, family he, members, he, any people yeah. that were around him that donated to him and supported him, the guilt trip that you have on yourselves, how you let this go along. For, and then for Bill Cosby, the same thing. How did you let this go on for decades upon decades? I don't know. I talked to Janice Dickinson about it. Um, and, you know, it was just like a, it was just like a thing. Yeah. It was like a thing that happened. I don't know. I'm not really, I guess I'm kind of naive to power structure, I guess. I don't know. There's things wrong with me. Um, but like, well, that's why I'm against the corporate structure. I mean, I'm, I, my thing is the broadcasters <laughs> podcast. I'm fighting for the content creators. I'm kind of, I'm fighting for the people that are, is the talent, the people behind the scenes. That's my, I mean, I'm, it's, I'm on a vo- on a soapbox here for this. What a antiquated. Well, question. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a soapbox that needs to be stood on 24 hours a day, apparently, because you know, yeah. there's still a faction of the population that's not getting it. They're still not getting it. And we will hammer, we will hammer home until them until we do. Um, but it, it's a, it's a very strange thing. And that's, uh, there's a, a thing that I picked up, you know, in this movement by all the people that are, you know, constantly talk about that is that people seem to think that um, the initial thought of like rape or sexual assault is that it is sexuality that has become aggressive. And it's not, it's the opposite. It's aggression that became sexual. Correct. I like the <laughs> way you put that. A, aggression first and it just manifested it in a sexual nature i agree um, with that i agree with that sucks, but that's you know that's the truth of the situation it's it was aggression first not now sexuality. rachel you're he doing your part anyway. well the thing is, you're doing your part and you're able to go ahead and have, have, the, have the voice that you have 
You know, you could talk to people. I mean, you know actors and actors. You know producers, directors. You know a lot of people in Hollywood. You have the connections. You go to the you go to the premieres. You get on the red carpet. I guess the mm. one thing is, um, I know it, it's like even with politics. Like if you don't follow a certain kind of path, then it's like the connections you have can only be there. And I can only I mean, I can see, understand it's just double edged sword, and it's got to be tough sometimes to kind of you know teetotal everything you have to go and do in Hollywood to continue to have, you know, what you're able to go and do in Hollywood in terms of being successful. Now, what about, what else do you think could happen that you think should be happening to curb the abuse of the casting couch and sexual harassment in general? Like, what else do you think could be done? It's, I mean, do you think there's some kind of a commission that should be or any kind of a policing of themselves? Because... I think, point, it's a lot, I think a lot of it is policing of themselves because this is what I, this is what I always say. And this is what I kind of started back in my documentary mm -hmm. is that like, when you go out and do these things to someone, like you're just admitting that you're trash. Like right. if you know, Harvey Weinstein, I always say that like, if he was just like a fun dude, if he was even just neutral, like not even that fun, just not a giant asshole. Like he would not have had these problems. He had tons of power you know, every party in the world to go to tons yep. of money was making, you know, in a, in a sexy business, like had he not been such a, just a slime ball, like just to like out to hurt people. Like that was his thing. He got off on hurting people from a power trip. Like he would have had people throwing themselves at him. Like this should not have been like a thing. So I always, this is a, a terrible comparison, but it just drives it home. So a few years ago, there was a military coup in Turkey. Uh -huh. And they had rounded, you know, it, the coup didn't really work out how they were planning. And they had rounded up these, you know, the resistance, so to speak. Yep. And yep. they threw them in jail. And they were using, like, state-sponsored rape as, like, a prison punishment. And I'm like, who signs up for this? Who's like... Like, what is the hiring process like for that? Like, do you have to show your dick and be like, it's ruined lives. It's terrible. I'm going to be great at this job. Like, or was there like a nomination committee? Like, my dick is bad. But Yosef, his dick is terrible. It's the worst. He'll never sleep again. Like, how? Like, how do you get this job? How? Like, what? What do you have to do? What's the application process? Like? So it's like, my comparison is, is like, if nobody wants it and you have to force it on somebody, that should like don't do that because then you're just admitting that it's awful and no one and no one wants it. Like just just keep it at home, <laughs> you know. Like don't don't go out parading like it's terrible. I'm just gonna force it on people. Like, don't, don't do that. It's 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 bad for them. It's it's also bad for you. Like, it's a society. You know, it's a societal dynamic too. I mean, honestly, I just think, think about the fact that you know when I read about just like in, in terms of psychology. I mean, just for men. <sighs> I just don't understand where sometimes, and I can't say for all men, but there is, it is one thing where it is more than men. And I'm not trying to be like some male feminist or anything like that. Okay. Just saying the facts is fact. Is that just it's some women? Statistical facts. Right. It's just that some men don't know what they're doing with women. They don't know what they're doing. They don't get it. And you're allowed so much room to fail and, and to make mistakes. And it just, the, the kind of people that are in society, whether they are like Turkish dictators or, or Hollywood producers and moguls, like the kind of people with that just attain power. And by the way, power doth corrupt on both sides of the aisle. Let's just say that too. But the thing is, Absolutely. this kind of of abuse is just it's sickening. And it just I don't get I just don't get sex crimes. I don't get that part. And you know it's. It, let me move along real quick. I, I got more to say about it, but I. Yeah. Yeah, because if I say I don't want to say something out of turn, because I could just go on and <laughs> just blow it if I could just spout off scorched earth if I want to do that. I want to talk about uh, from the the street dot com. Rebecca Rose Woodland, she's a litigator, litigator and legal analyst. She did a recent interview when it comes to crimes of sex crimes in Hollywood. She says this quote. What happens then is, which happens often with lawsuits, is that there is a deterrent effect. I'm hoping that it not only puts the bad guys behind bars, but it deters people. It changes conduct. It makes people aware that this sort of conduct won't be tolerated anywhere across America and across the world because what this man did was victimize women. The jury found out to be the case. 
but there are other many other victims of other sexual crimes, women, men, they, it doesn't matter who. We want to discourage that from happening across the world and moving to a place of more peaceful society where people respect each other. How do you view that statement? Absolutely. And that's, I think that was a, for for the home, for the, you know, for the super close to home and the domestic side of it. Yeah. Like yeah. Harvey Weinstein had every, every resource at his disposal to squash this, just like he's been squashing it for years. But the man spent $600,000 for former Israeli Mossad and other like, <laughs> private detective agencies to build these like giant dossiers on like the Rose McGowan's of the world. Like oh. it's very, very hard to be somebody who went to interview to go be his nanny. And then he attacked them to go up against even a quarter of that. Like going to court is really hard. Um, it's not as hard as people think. And if somebody wrongs you, you should, then it's an actual offense. You should take action, but it is hard. It will be, drag you through the dredges of your life um and then to go that to go do that against someone who has every available resource and can drag this out until the end of time is extremely daunting so on the flip side of that like what she's talking about is like yeah hopefully somebody who doesn't have who has that much juice or not even any of it is like yeah i don't want i don't want to do that i don't want to do that because you know mr harvey's in isolation right now but if he was in general population you be getting that ass tore up Medea style. So if that's what you want in your future, like you can make the same choices as old Harvey, or you can just. I think about the fact that Rachel, I mean, I really think about, because first of all, there is just so many different people that come into Hollywood that are even the same thing when you see people going from, you know, from some small town America to New York city and just the vulnerability. Because here's the thing. You're looking at you, okay, young, probably quite beautiful, precocious, could be a little bit naive, who knows at 12 years old, how you came and what kind of a life you've lived prior to go ahead and getting yourself in front of a camera and dealing with all the people of the world, all these different, you know, management and, you know, photographers and directors and whoever people that are handling your career and to put the trust on them and there could just be these bad actors across the board i'm i'm honestly happy to see that you've made it through after all this time that you didn't get caught up into something like that or i, I don't know you know i'm really shocked that i didn't but i'm also from detroit so <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> i think that you know the, the lord works in mysterious ways yes and i think that probably had a lot to do with it and again i don't understand power structure so if somebody was to be like oh hey let's do this i'd be like yeah i gotta go like and just not right. give it a second thought right. um but yeah i a, a lot of that is just god's protection and being from detroit originally so it's, exactly I'm, i've already seen worse take your take your tinsel town crap somewhere else um <sighs> wow but yeah, it, it is shocking to me. And people assume that about me. Like, they think because I, like, I shouldn't say that I work in the space because I don't make it money with my podcast. But like, because I'm so heavily involved in that space, they're like, oh, you must have been whatever. And I'm like, no, actually not. <laughs> like, yeah. I wasn't, but an advocate nonetheless. Amazing. I want to ask also about this because that's also the other thing that most contracts have because everybody's under contracts. And that's why certain things can get away, like they get away with, right? Bloomberg mm -hmm. story, a uh, Bloomberg law, excuse me. They had a story titled workplace morals clauses take hold beyond showbiz and the me too era. Now here's what they said. Morality clauses quote, which allow companies to terminate contracts based on behavior that could damage corporate reputation, largely appear in contracts for Hollywood actors and endorsement deals with stars or athletes, but their use is expanded into C suites as employers on wall street, taking it to the other level and beyond seek to avoid backlash from executive misconduct that can hit their bottom lines. So what do you think about this growing trend that Hollywood was responsible for the morals clause to be much more prominent across every other, every other business sector? I mean, I think that's a great idea. And I think um, Hollywood should also do it too, because like, you know, as an actor or, you know, most of the time is it like, a, you know, a front facing, you know, even above the line people, um, do have these morals clauses in their contracts, but excuse me, for whatever reason that doesn't um, extend to network executives or studio executives. Like there's been several networks, i.e. children's networks like Disney 
and Nickelodeon yeah. that have these morals clauses, you know, and their performer contracts for children or for the adults on those networks. And they're strict. You can't do this. You can't do that. Blah, 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 blah. But they regularly pile pedophiles behind the scenes, known child molesters. So, and I've heard some names about that. Tell, yeah. How are you going to tell Hannah Montana she needs to adhere to a, a morals clause when you're over here hiring and rehiring pedophiles? Like, if I, and I'm <laughs> trying to, pl- I'm not to put the blame on anybody because, uh, you know, you know, uh, innocent until proven guilty. But if I hear another thing about Dan Schneider at Nickelodeon again, my God, I, I only am afraid of some of the things I hear that rumors and innuendo that come out there. And I only can wonder. You know, who else is out there that's causing some things like this that is being kept so tightly woven, uh, you know, tightly lipped that nobody's talking about? And obviously the morality clause is very important. I just think, you know, you know, again, listen to the victims. I mean, if, you know, regardless, kind of listen to people and, and take people for the chance and just, you know, investigate things as they come across and find out what's going on because it just it's scary to see all this is going on. I mean, everything merits due diligence, everything. Like there's nothing, you know, I'm not really a, a huge, I know that's an unpopular opinion to the friend that I have, but I'm not like a big like cheerleader for like believe all women or believe all whatever. Like right. I don't actually think that's a good policy. Like I, you know, I do believe in due process and I think it's really, really important yes. um, for everybody involved. And, and that's not just here where it's constitutionally enshrined, but like across the world and even aliens, let's express, let's extend you across the state. <laughs> right, right, um, right. But I think that's important. And I think, um, as a, back to harken back to the whole like culture shift and like self-policing and things like that of like, okay, every time somebody sends something, we have to unpack this bag fully and get everything out and see what the deal is. Like nothing's automatic as it shouldn't be. Like yep. nothing should be automatic. We have to, you know, put the effort into the due process and the due diligence and investigating what happened and going from there. No, no, like knee jerk moves have never served anybody. So let's not and right. say that we did. Exactly. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of things where you're seeing it even just like on social media. You're seeing just that everyday people are kind of getting themselves caught up in the cancel culture and just a, a, a real moral puritanistic kind of feel if anybody has any kind of opinion or thought process that doesn't go with the status quo. It's just like – and the thing is, is that – there's got to be an openness, an opportunity for people to go ahead and say whether a free speech, damn it. Where is that? Be able to go ahead and say if something's happening, you know, people should go ahead and, you know, be able to speak up, not only speak, well, I mean, but it, speak up. It went, it went the same place, you know, mature adults went. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just not, it just doesn't seem to be um, around anymore. And for whatever reason, you know, the fanatical has such a loud voice that, um, I mean, and I feel like this is my own life. Like, I can see the writing on the wall. I know what's up. When things don't add up, they just don't add up. And, like, it's plain to see that. And I'm not really trying to argue with anybody about it. Um, And we have, you know, really put a premium on this whole, like, debate about it, debate about it. It's like, mm, yes. Debating and arguing. Debating discourse. That's a, that, yeah. We should have much more of that. Please. I would love that. I like to have that. I don't like this being shut down. I'm, there's some certain things I can't say or, or can't do. It's just not fair. Now, I want to move along a little more into this and delve into the fact of how the same story about morals clauses. This is the interesting part. So a business law professor at University of Miami, Patricia Abril, uh, she said this also because even though – they, these morality clauses can be overreaching in an era where ubiquitous internet t- activity and political sensitivity has put everybody's off-duty speech, conduct, and reputation out of the microscope. So when they're not behind the camera, even what you say that's not even like, you know, on the record, off the record, you are being watched. You are being, you know, monitored. Absolutely. Now, yeah. here, here's the thing that she, she says here. Um, while they can suppress misconduct, the agreements can serve as a powerful tool for companies to insulate themselves from biased claims, terminate contracts, if there's public backlash. She says this, quote, 
Morals clauses can become more problematic when there is a great differential of power between the parties. It's not hard to imagine a situation in today's world of social media where some kind of behavior can embarrass the company. People today are more likely to judge that person, and that can lead to reputational spillover on the company. People come to quick judgments. Absolutely correct. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, but I do. And again, I think that's a maturity thing, too. Like, I think when somebody, you know, when Ariana Grande licks a donut at the Corona place on third street and says some dumb stuff like, yeah. okay, whatever. Or whatever she did with the donuts thing. I forgot what it was. Yeah, she, did with she, the donuts thing. <laughs> she like, she like licked a donut behind a thing and then said, oh, <laughs> Americans are like, just stop. It's just something, <laughs> something Ari esque, right? And yeah. should she have done it? No, but <laughs> like, did she do that while at a press junket for Nickelodeon for Sam and Cat? Or no, she didn't. Right. Like, right. That was on that was on Ariana's own time. Um, and you know, there's that argument. I was like, oh, well, they're a public figure, and like, oh, it's like, well, no, they still have their own time. They're not working in a, a professional capacity right now, and that's um, just something that. I think we've seen a lot play out with like Megan and Harry lately is that, uh, you know, every little thing is scrutinized and it's like, well, you know, when she's walking the dog down the street in Canada, like she's not, she's not, perform- she's not shaking a dignitary's hand. Like her dog's taking a shit. Like if this is not, this is not news kids. It's not. Like, yeah. I still can't believe Rachel from Suits is royalty. I still never will get over that. And she got married to another you know, prince. Like, I still can't believe that. But- believe it. <laughs> I think she got a way better deal than she did, honestly. Oh, probably. <laughs> in, my, in my opinion. Oh, See, uh, God. I remember I... seeing her at Gifting Suites back in the day. Say again? So I remember seeing her at Gifting Suites back in the day. Really? Yeah. I mean, this is a million years ago. But, yeah. Oh yeah! Oh, you bought me that whole that whole crew of chicks from like the uh, the dealer no deal days, like Joanna Krupa, Rachel wow. Sterling. Uh, well, but you know what? Okay, uh, this is the point I got to make this before I miss this. Okay, there is a line where you can go ahead if there's stuff that you're doing outside and you're just like living your life. Absolutely, you know. But then there's also times where celebrities can take it upon themselves. They can go on the social media, use that platform, don't realize what they're saying, and like, oh shit, Vanessa Hudgens. What the fuck did you just say? What are you doing? <laughs> well, don't, I mean, you're trying to ruin for, your career. I don't like uh, you. Don't do that. Luckily for Vanessa Hudgens, she doesn't really work anymore. So I guess she doesn't have to worry about these things. But um, <laughs> she's a lovely girl. She's a. a I, the, I thought the, she yeah. was great. And by the way, I saw her in Bad Boys for Life. I thought she was great. And I was like, come on. Oh, oh, oh she, she did a job. That's fantastic. Um, most of the time, the last time I see her for the last few years is at the Mel's on Sunset. Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I think you have to think about like your likability and stuff like that. And like, who really cares about other people's opinions? Like, hashtag nobody. Like, that's just not. Yeah. Um, like, unless you're directly involved in some way, I don't see how it's relevant like oh my opinion on this except i've never experienced it i've never been by it and like i'm just telling you what i think like please please hush your mouth and let the adults talk you know like i i think there's something to be said for that but there's also like this for whatever strange reason like the public outcry like this person should speak on this it's like why why for what Exactly. I'll tell you, there's one guy that I think about from radio that I always, uh, I used to listen to a lot, but not as much because even when he went to podcasting, it's not the same when he doesn't have a phone call. People can call in regularly and all. He always talks about Tom Likas, who was an L.A. base, right? I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say I could feel you about to say Tom Likas. Yes. I he feel always talks about... Do not say anything you have to apologize for because you do not need to apologize. You're just weakening your stance. That's the most important thing I live. And I honestly, I've taken that to heart is that I'm going to make sure if I go on any program or I say anything at all, it's going to be something I will not have to apologize for. I might have to clarify, but not apologize. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, what? it's like a deal, you know, like you need to be able to walk away from a deal in 10 seconds. And you also need to be able to stand by what you said. So think about it before you say it. Yes. And be like, no, I feel that way. I said what I said. You know, there's yeah. Thank God for me, leaves. Like, 
Exactly. You said, you said what you said, but at the same time, though, there's like this um, this public hunger to be apologized to, which is a really oh. strange dynamic. But a lot of people made a lot of money for it. Like um, Farrah Abraham comes to mind, and I used to share a couple. It's like an orgasm yeah. or something. It's really ridiculous. I can't it stand it. It is really strange. Like, Farrah will go out and do something, just being Farrah. And then people be like, oh, my God, Farrah, you're such an evil cunt. And then she's like, <laughs> oh, okay. And then, she, then she's like, okay, great. And then she'll do a bunch of press because people uh, were, you know, calling her names. And then after she's done doing that press, She'll do apology press. Like she's a machine. <laughs> machine. But she knows what she's doing. She knows exactly what she's doing. Apology press. I haven't heard yeah. that one before. Oh my God. That's just horrible. Well, let me I ask you. I got to ask about this then. So let me get to the documentary because I haven't had a chance to. I'm, we got to plug, plug, plug for you. So the You Slut documentary, great name. Um, it talked about sexuality, shaming, and gender based violence around the world. At the time when you were promoting this, she's. Yes, 2016. At the time you promoted it, you said, quote, I'm doing my best as a first-time director to seek out all different kinds of women sharing the commonality of shame and give them a louder voice than those trying to silence them. Mm -hmm. So several years removed, talk to me about the mark you've made with that and how your podcast continues to deliver that message. Oh, my gosh. I have really had no idea what I was getting into when I was doing that because I feel like looking back on it, it's like now it's like more relevant than even it was then, which is crazy. But, um... I started in Hollywood, started with um, Amber Rose's Slut Walk in downtown LA, and that was like a really interesting experience. And uh, this dude, Brother Dean, showed up, if that's what he calls himself, I don't know his real name. Um, but he's like one of these guys that runs around with a bullhorn um, and like signs, like, if you wear yoga pants, like, you deserve to be raped, or like, or you're asking to be raped, whatever. Like, he's got a new slogan every day, like, you can just Google him. But um, he's over here with his bullhorn, you know, doing his thing, and these, you know, girls are just, it, of all flavors and varieties and guys too. Yeah. Um, you know, just there to experience the experience and contribute to it or whatever. So that was really interesting. I interviewed um, people there and I did interviews. I talked to VH1 and MTV and like a lot of the press outlets that were there. And then I interviewed other ladies around Hollywood, like Tiffany Haddish. I and can't believe, I can't believe, what a coup. Wow. I mean, she was just and now look where she's gone how far she's come since in four it's, years i'll tell you yeah i know it's crazy tiffany's been my friend forever and like she used to come to my house for thanksgiving when i would cook oh she's great <laughs> i think she's, she's awesome i love her so much um and tess Bussard and um a couple girls in like the porn industry and like just you know just i just i just got on the horn and like called the cavalry like everybody come through we got things to talk about and we did and it was amazing um yep. And just talked about like those different different levels of shame from different things. Like Tiffany talked about this um, this guy that she met when she was a teenager who was a nurse somewhere, and I guess he was like 24, 25. And you have to listen to Tiffany tell the story because that's. Oh, where I got to hear really the trailer good. so far, and I, I started <laughs> going off about. It. I'm like, I could listen to her just talk about this for a while because she's like oh so so un uh, so uninhibited so uncensored blatant, oh my God. blunt oh, i love yeah. it she's oh, yeah. she's talented very talented very funny love her and i gotta tell you um when it comes to you know the fact that you also talk to porn stars you talk to those in the adult industry i got to yeah. delve into that as well i got to go and take a microphone around uh working a couple different events I worked at internet in las vegas i got to do uh uh forget what the other one's called it was a oh, i can't think of it now uh Exotica, that's the other one, with three yeah. X's on it. So I got to talk to, you know, Tara Patrick and Ron Jeremy and Jesse Jane and all those types. And I'll oh, tell God. you, honestly, I, I, I thought those, I thought the industry, first of all, I loved it. I thought the people were great. Because I mean, a, lot of, a lot of them are good to each other. There was one girl that talked about how, like, um, there was, like, like horror shaming, like, within in the, in the industry, which I thought was a really interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um, or... Um, there was one girl who cosplays and she also does porn and she was talking about how, and this kind of tipped me into like this whole cosplay rabbit hole that I fell down, which was really fun. Um, but how like she got more shame for doing cosplay than she did Ugh. for doing porn. She's like, what is this? Like what? Like I'm wearing a Tinkerbell outfit. Like, seriously? <laughs> like what? how is this a problem for you? Um, so that was kind of like, you know, the third wave Western version of it. 
and then um, took it to Jamaica, and that was kind of an experience because like, yeah. forty percent of Jamaicans like their first sexual experience is either coerced or just straight up rape, and that's like a whole culture in the Caribbean that they oh. won't really talk about. But that's apparently I'm not the person to like really have story to life, but I'm sure. Wow. Cool. And then I went to Europe and covered Sweden, which is the rape capital of the Western world. It's only second to La Post House in South Africa, and then the sex attacks in Cologne on New Year's Eve. Uh, wow. Which ever nobody knew about nobody knew about that at the time oh they don't um, no there's nothing to talk about that i don't i mean another thing too is that also you're about you know the, the migration issue the, the migrating of all these yeah. different people from different well countries. that's why that's why nobody was willing to talk about it and it was so funny too because like from a filmmaking standpoint as soon as i put out that first teaser i had so many people calling me like trying to get on the train because they thought i was going to give them a job or they wanted to get yeah. involved or whatever and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go, you know, check out this Germany thing and go run through some of these refugee camps and see what's up. And they're like, oh, my God, like, you can't be so blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yes, I can. I don't need your money. Goodbye. Like, exactly. There was, um, I'm not going to say that I, like, lost friends from it, but I lost a lot of respect for some people that called me um, during that time. Because they're like, oh, well, you can't say that. I'm like, you, you go watch me. Like, <laughs> yeah. like you can't. You can't tell me that Angela Merkel blowing open their borders to 1.4 million people from Thank God you. knows where, and then having the largest coordinated sexual assault in recorded history, and then and then suppress the story in not only the European media but the global media, and then when it finally started leaking around Europe, by the other countries raised their hands and said "Me too" before it was a "Me too" thing. They had the same situation happen. And then on top of it, they, um, a, a memo was leaked from Angela Merkel to the mayor of Cologne. The mayor of Cologne, who was a woman and the victim of a knife attack herself, um, saying that you need to tell your chief of police to go back and expunge the word rape from any of these police reports. Oh, there was over 600 police reports that night for theft, sexual assault, rape, like you name it, the whole gamut, right? They only arrested three people, and it was because they had stolen cell phones and for no other reason. Um, but it's like, these things are related, they're related, and Sweden had a similar situation. Um, Sweden has been, you know, Scandinavia always tells themselves, it's like, we don't even have prisons here, because there is no crime. It's like, no, there's crime, you just don't do anything about it, like, there's a difference. Um, and that was another, uh, every single person that I met on this entire tour of the world, this lap of the world that I did, um, had been dogged out by the media so severely, it was just disgusting. I interviewed a girl in Sweden um, who was on this like an interfjordal like graduation cruise. She's gay, and a guy in her life, and a guy took her in a cabin and raped her, and also gave her uh, herpes simplex one that she will have to live with for the rest of her life. And um, the ship security did throw him in the brig, but as soon as they got back to the dock. The police came and he was like, oh, she wanted me to. And they took the handcuffs off of him and they sent him on his merry way. He wasn't arrested. He wasn't booked. They didn't fingerprint him. He never had to go before a judge, nothing. And the Swedish media would not print in her story that she was gay because it's not a Swedish thing to say. I still think about, and I remember, oh, I remember so vividly, when Don Lemon had on CNN, Ami Horowitz who talked about uh, Stockholm Syndrome, his documentary about Sweden and the issues mm -hmm. of rape and, and uh, sexual crimes up there. Same thing. I'm just thinking, uh, but again, it was just going to get shot down, shot down. I'm like, and I just remember they were fighting about the rape cases, about how many were being reported, but it's like, no, that's not the proper agency that you're getting it from. It's This is the actual source you're getting it from. It's so underreported. Huh. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's like sweep it under the rug. It's ridiculous. You just made me think about that. I was like, oh, God damn it, man. And I, and this it's, is, uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing. Like sexual crimes from a perpetrator standpoint is like one of the perfect crimes to commit because your victim doesn't want to tell anyone and they don't want to report you. Rachel, I'm, I, I love you. I'm so grateful that you are so fucking brave that you are taking oh this God. on. Because honestly, it's not, it's, you got to take some courage here to do that. Especially when you, and you know, because there's risk involved. I mean, the thing is, you definitely putting yourself out there and it's like, who else is going to do it? Somebody's got to be that fighter. I'm like, and I'm glad you're fighting for those that are not, you know, voice of the voiceless. That's wonderful. And I'm really grateful that you put this documentary together. You're going together with No Filler Fridays and, and making that possible to go and do that. But I got to ask you about, you know, what brought you to the dance here, brought you to the documentary, brought you to your podcast, your work in Hollywood. So I, I got to ask the one industry question. And I ask everybody from Hollywood ever get, get on the show now. Backstage recently wrote, 
quote, from Broadway to movie theaters to labor unions, industry leaders are bracing for entertainers and audiences to get sick. And for an industry that relies on social gatherings to undergo long-term financial effects, end quote. So what can you tell me about how the pandemic has affected you, those you know from show business? Also, you have to, you know, add on top of it the labor agreements, which are all being negotiated by, you had WG and ATA going back to last April. Then you got the AMPTP. And you got yeah. then SAG after which you you have your card, correct? Yes. So talk to me about the effect that's had on you and those you know. Okay, so currently, like everything shut down, which really, really, really blows because me and my business partner, um, I work with uh, Jason Avalos a lot. And we um, have a production company called Schoolhouse Pictures, um, and we work together a lot. Not every day, you know, not not everything, but most things. Um, because I have a very hard time rocking without him, and he has a very hard time without rocking without me. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> we're just like, uh, just this combination of bougie and ratchet that just makes things happen. Um, but him and I sat in September and did our entire plan for the year. Like I was, if you asked me in September, October, November, December of last year, I would tell you exactly everything I would think I was doing from January one to December thirty first of twenty twenty. Um, completely booked completely booked and guess what i'm no longer booked for the oh, next no. foreseeable future yes it sucks like i was supposed to be in jamaica this month shooting music videos for my friends but they decided to stay um oh. in russia because they did um so that sucks and then there's obviously nothing going in town and then i heard from kevin Platt. here's a here's a exclusive here's a no filter friday tea uh -huh. um Heard from Kevin Feige yesterday, who runs Marvel, that they're Ooh. not even considering reopening production until August. Wow. No, Marvel produced. I heard a lot of production still July, but I didn't realize August. Man. Yeah. They're and, not even and there's a lot of releases they're going to get pushed back. And I, I saw Black Widow finally got pushed back to August, I think it is. And I'm just, yeah, you have to. There's no choice. The no whole choice. year's make a shot. Real short, yeah, real short awards show season. Um, a lot of movies are just going to get dumped in streaming, which, you know, could revamp the streaming streaming industry for all I know. We'll see. But I can't we'll stand that. Hey, Rachel, mm -hmm. I love going to the theaters. I like my popcorn. I got a, I got a Regal Cinema subscription. And I, I, I don't want to be in the movie. <laughs> like, honestly, I knew and I knew the theaters were going to get shut down. So I, I say, I don't care what, how good the movies are or not. I want to go see Bloodshot. I want to go see The Hunt. I saw them on that last weekend, two weekends ago. I'm like, I'm glad I did, but it's unfortunate. And I don't feel like watching on Netflix. And it's just not the same like they're going to the cinema. It's, not, it's really not. Especially for the sound perspective. Like, even if you have a absolutely. theater in your home, it's still not the same. Five to one is meant to be heard in a movie theater with the, you know, behind the screen and then like your sound on the sides and, the, you know, rear and all that stuff. Agreed. <laughs> oh no, I, I, I miss my RPX, man. I, yeah. I miss five the IMAX. One sound is so expensive to do and it cannot be heard in any other environment hardly. I think what the hardest part about this year is outside of just like the personal implications of like, we're not supposed to shoot anything. Um, yeah. I don't care. I'm going to continue to shoot music videos. Shit. Um, <laughs> right. But I spent all of February hopping around Asia. I did eight flights through five airports. And then I came home and worked until the 20th uh -huh. um, with clients. And if I was going to catch this raggedy bitch, I would have done caught it. Um, right. Well, I still so, think that, uh, well, I mean, again, media is, is definitely overblown this whole thing. I'm not, I, I am not mm -hmm. saying I'm mean, not taking this very seriously. I've sat here in my house for 10 days. I am taking this shit seriously. But the media is not helping. I even got to tell my family. Yeah. Like I'm telling my parents, stop watching the goddamn TV news. Stop watching it's it. It's it. so cancerous. You're going to get. I mean, I say that in a regular situation. Like, don't watch this. <laughs> you have that's, not, that's, when this is, that's when it's good times. Let alone now. Right. Mm -mm. No, turn it off because they have, you know, the, the panic brings profit. And as you'll, as you'll notice, um, the government and the mainstream media, they're not taking any kind of days off except they're telling you. That you can't go to work. So yeah. we'll see what happens when April first rolls around and these checks aren't here and bills aren't actually canceled. We'll see how we'll see how far um, how this how how this hysteria kind of pans out. Amen, sister. I am I am locked up with you, podcaster at arms. Again, we can promote. <laughs> Again, it's uh through Public House Media. Uh, no filter Friday, no filter Friday, excuse me, no filter Friday. Look for it where all major podcasts are available. I know you're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, you're on all the major ones. And yeah. uh, give me the website for uh, Public House Media so they can find the show. I believe it's just 
publichousemedia.org. We're Perfect. very easy to find. Yeah, if you Google me, if you Google Public House Media, if you Google No Filter Friday, um, it will all come up because, you know, well past the 100 episode mark and people tend to have opinions on my podcast, especially if I do, I talk about Woody Allen. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> so, but I, I love that you're, I love that you're so lax about it. Like, you know, well, first of all, for podcasting, I don't know what your favorites are, but I mean, for me, Joe Rogan is like the standard bearer. Like, th that guy's just like, he makes it so fucking simple. It, it pisses me off, but it also I like I love it at the same time. I really do. Um, Twitter is Rachel A. Letter A yeah, Mullins. I, yes, I like to keep things confusing. So Twitter is at Rachel A. Mullins, and then Instagram and Facebook is at Rachel M. And it's M U L L I N S. In case anybody thinks it could be, because I've seen it spelled the other way as well. And also R A C H E L, and not the extra yes. A. So also yes. getting confusing too. <laughs> The basic bitch way. There's no, don't throw in the next <laughs> way. Rachel, I've loved this interview. You um, are a doll. Perfect. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for, some, for mm -hmm. joining me. And uh, I wish all the best. And please stay safe and be well. Absolutely. Send me, send me the things and we will, we, we will, um, we'll flex on the gram together. Totally. And we're clear. Thank you so much. You were so awesome. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. And I'll tell you another thing I didn't mention on the show, but, 